We live in a world where there's lots of bad news. It seems to come in waves, waves, waves. Even if we don't look at the news outside, just look at the news in our families. Every human being who's born eventually grows ill, ages, dies. If our happiness depends on things outside being just the way we want them to be, this is the wrong place. Fortunately, happiness doesn't have to come from outside. The happiness we need, the happiness that's food for the mind. The Buddha says it actually comes from three different sources. One is contact at the senses, another is awareness at the senses, and then the third is our intentions. Now in terms of contact, the Buddha says you look at that, you look for happiness there. And for the most part you're looking in the wrong place. Although there is one area that the Buddha does talk about, and the Ajahns talk about a lot. Which is that wherever you live, make sure it's clean. If you keep the place where you live clean, it brightens the mind. People talk about going to see a John Munn for the first time, even though a John Munn lived in the forest. They always commented on how clean the forest was around the area where he, where he lived. The area was always swept, everything was placed very neatly. And of course, you might say, well, he had lots of time to keep the place clean. But it's striking how it really does have an effect on your mind. You put in a little effort to keep the place clean, and then you look at look around you. And it's inspiring. It teaches you an important lesson, that you really can make a difference in your environment. And what you put into the present moment can repay you. Because that's what, when we talk about having conviction in the Buddha's awakening, that's what we have conviction in. The fact that our happiness and pain in life come from our actions. And some of the things come from our past actions, but the important things come from our actions in the present moment. So even though your surroundings may not be as ideal as you would like them, you can keep them clean. You show that you put something into the situation, and you can really change it. That's an important lesson. As for the other types of, of food, consciousness or awareness of the senses goes together with contact. And then there's the intentions. And these are things that come totally from inside. They may be influenced by past actions, but you can train them here in the present moment to be something new. This is a freedom that's available to all of us, and that we don't take as advantage of as much as we should. Simply in the way we breathe, we can have a sense of well-being in the body. By the way we talk to ourselves, which the Buddha calls verbal fabrication, we can totally change our mood. And in terms of mental fabrication, the perceptions and feelings we focus on, we're totally free to perceive a situation in lots of different ways, all of which are true. And then we can ask ourselves, well, which of these is the most conducive for keeping the mind happy, to keeping the mind acting in skillful ways? Choose that perception, choose those feelings. And then you can feed on those. That's the food of intention. And so in this way we can create happiness from within. Because we live in a world where we have to have a lot of endurance. When you hear the word endurance, it seems to be nothing but pain and more pain and more pain for a long period of time. But the key to true endurance is realizing you don't have to focus on the pains. You can focus on the things that are good in the present moment starting from within. And if within doesn't seem all that good, well, there is some help from outside. This is the other aspect of food from sensory contact, is we can listen to the Dharma. 
we can see the example of other people who, who have been practicing the Dharma and are practicing the Dharma. And it's refreshing to the mind. Suppose we lived in a world where there was no Dharma, where all people would think about was gaining wealth, gaining power, no sense of right or wrong, no sense of generosity, no sense of virtue. It would be a hard world to live in. It's not the kind of world you would want to live in. But here we live in a world where people teach generosity, where they teach virtue. They teach getting some control over your mind through meditation. And they not only teach about these things, they also practice these things to show how it's done. When we think about that fact, then even though there are a lot of undesirable things in the world, but the fact that there, is, there are people who recognize goodness and teach the way to goodness. and give rise to a sense that this is a world that's a good world to live in, despite all the ups and downs. And then we realize, though, we can't just listen to the Dharma. We should also think about it. When the Buddha talks about getting the most out of the Dharma, he says you listen to it, and then you think about it using what he calls appropriate attention. This involves, one, he says, not despising the speaker, two, not despising the Dharma, three, not despising yourself. In other words, you're willing to listen to the Dharma, and when you see there's something good in the Dharma, you remind yourself, I can do this. The fourth quality is that you focus totally on the Dharma. In other words, you give it your whole mind. Listen to it single-mindedly, the Buddha says. And then finally, use appropriate attention. Ask yourself, how does this teaching it apply to the suffering that I'm undergoing right now? How does it teach me to comprehend that suffering? How does it teach me to let go of the cause? And to let go of the cause, what's the path of practice that I should develop? Ask those questions. And that's when you're listening to the Dharma in the appropriate way, because you keep bringing the Dharma in to what's going on in your mind right now the way you're ex shaping your experience right now. And then you try to develop whatever qualities the talk recommends. In the present moment, it talks about mindfulness, you try to be more mindful. It talks about alertness, you try to be more alert. It talks about ardency, you try to put your heart into doing this well. And the results are bound to come. So in this way, there are three sources for happiness, just like there are three sources for discernment. In the text, they're talking about discernment coming from listening, discernment coming from thinking, and discernment coming from developing good qualities. Well, the same three categories apply to happiness. There's happiness that comes from listening. You realize that there's still good dharma in the world. The happiness that comes from thinking, when you realize how this applies to you, and it, it's not just dharma pointing out there, it's something out there some other time, some other place. It's pointing to it right here, right now. So you think about how that's true, and then you carry out what the Dharma recommends. And that's how you find a happiness that's really solid. Because what does the Dharma recommend? It recommends the Eightfold Path, and the heart to the Eightfold Path is right concentration. And right concentration is always defined by the feeling tone, either rapture and pleasure, or just pleasure on its own, or equanimity. all of which are good feelings that you can give rise to from within, totally independent of anything outside. And that's how you find your inner resources. There's an incident in Thai history where a neighboring country came in to attack the Thai capital. And the Thai capital, even though opposing forces had laid siege around the city, was able to withstand the siege for a long time, because within the city walls there were gardens, there were fields, there were wells. In other words, there were sources of food and water inside the city, so they could hold out for as long as they wanted to. In fact, the only reason why the, the siege was able to 
be victorious was that someone inside would turn traitor, open the gates, let the enemy in. That's a good image for the mind as we live through difficult times. Because we have to remember that there's always difficulty in living in the human world. If we came to the human world thinking we we're going to get an easy ride all the way through, we've come to the wrong place. Even in the best conditions, there's still aging, there's still illness, there's still death. We have to prepare for these things. But the best way to hold up to those difficulties, the best way to endure, is not simply just to grit your teeth and tell yourself to endure. It's to find happiness from within. So think of all the fields that you have inside that you haven't yet cultivated, all the wells that you haven't taken water from yet. Take advantage of those. Protect those. Don't turn traitor to your own good interests. And you'll be able to endure without thinking about endurance at all. You'll be thinking more about the well-being that you're developing inside, that you can manufacture from within. And that can keep you going. So remember, the only reliable source of happiness is inside. And do your best to look here to find your well-being. so that whatever happens from outside you can endure, but not have a sense of being weighed down. <laughs>